Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. You told us last week. Yeah, you you say praise the Lord. You say Hallelujah. Yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then and then he says Hallelujah, and then you say praise the Lord. You know, Brandy uh, read a scripture that uh, could have been just taken right off my text or notes. She had no idea that I was going to speak to what I was going to speak to this morning. But the scripture that she had quoted in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, I don't know exactly where she started, but I think it was in 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. This is different from His throne of judgment. And this is different from that which He has already done as it relates to His servants. Uh, Matthew chapter 25 up to that point uh, addresses His family his servants, and he judges each one of them at his bema according to their works. But there in verse 31, he picks up with the Gentile judgments. And sometimes we, not sometimes, most of the time we relate those judgments to the, to the church. When in actuality, those, those judgments there, the separating of the sheep from the goats, has to do with the, with the Gentile judgment. Do you follow me? Do you hear me? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm saying to you that there is a time when the Lord does judge the Gentiles and the Gentile nations. He does it in a very strong way. And that's, that's really what I'm going to address in this message. It's the gathering up before him. Setting the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So, rightly dividing the Word of God uh, calls for a distinguishing of this age from the coming age. There's a soon coming age, uh, the age of judgment, that follows right on the heels of this age of mercy and grace. Understanding the ages, the judgments, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of God, will reveal the essential right attitude for our living today as a Christian. In other words, it'll incentivize us in order that we might ensure our character, our nature, are in line with the Lord that we might inherit a part in the kingdom, the kingdom coming. There also in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, we have the Lord saying to his disciples, After this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This prayer is directed to his disciples, but it's actually uh, his own. That's the prayer of the Lord, especially these, this verse 10 where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> By this I mean it was Christ's mission. It was for the reason Christ was birthed into this world, that he might bring about the kingdom of God into the earth. So first of all, when the Lord instructs these, his disciples, in what we have described as the Lord's Prayer, he himself prays this prayer. Thy kingdom come. He knew what was between him and the manifestation of that was a, a suffering journey. 
It did not deter him. He didn't expound here. He only left a, an allusion to a walk that would be required of those that would follow after him as his disciples. And that, that walk of suffering, full of temptation, trial, and test. And that's why he put that part in there, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. That was because he knew the walk would be treacherous for himself and then him to his disciples. He, he gave that charge that we should pray, the Lord lead us not into temptation or lead us away from temptation. Deliver us from evil. Why? Because his kingdom is coming. And those that are found fit and worthy will have a part in that kingdom. So again, the purpose of Christ's mission was the fulfilling of the word, thy kingdom come. The new covenant fills with meaning God's purposes or God's purpose in recreating the earth in typical six days fashion and then rested on the seventh. And then also the creating of man and involving him in the creation and inviting him into the rest on the seventh day. Creating, recreating the earth. God had a mission. He had a purpose. It wasn't that he lacked anything to do that he recreated the earth. But in this word of Christ, thy kingdom come, you can find the purpose of God in the recreating. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can find the recreation's purpose. And you can find the purpose of man in the creation on the sixth day. And then his invitation to participate with God in a work in the naming of these beasts, etc. But as it transcends into man's future after the fall, it alludes to the fact that man enters into a spiritual work, a spiritual work that's represented in the sixth day recreation work. And then he invites him into that seventh day millennial rest. Are you with me? Are you following me at all? <laughs> the understandings of his purposes are first introduced in the book of Genesis. I'm looking for the purposes of the kingdom coming. And those purposes are first realized in your indulging your uh, spiritual wits uh, into the understanding of the first two chapters of Genesis. It is there that we can find the purposes of God in the recreation as it relates to the kingdom coming. After man's fall, God's purposes revealed his intent also included the just destruction of his enemies. Here we go to Brandy's reading of that prayer. I mean that prophetic word there found in Genesis chapter 25, 31, where it begins to speak in terms of separating the goats and the sheep. There's an allusion there back to the first book of Genesis where God recreates the heavens and the earth. And then in chapter 2 and 3, the disclosure of the fall of Adam with that further revealing of God's purposes in the destruction of his enemies, in the crushing of Satan's head. This is the revealed purpose of God in his kingdom come. Are you following me? I don't 
I don't ask that question because I think that you're lacking in aptitude. I've just asked the question because I don't feel as if I am making it clear. And I just want to be clear with you in this very essential, important understanding of thy kingdom come, the judgments that are, are preceding it are spoken of from the very beginning. And it helps us greatly to see that God has said the end from the beginning. And that as we learn the scriptures, we can rightly connect the dots down through Genesis, the prophets, the Psalms, into the New Covenant, and down finally into the book of Revelation. And that's where we're going. We're going to the book of Revelation, but we're establishing the foundation of the prayer of Jesus when he said, Thy kingdom come. He's talking about the Father. Your, your will be done, Father. Your kingdom come on the earth as it is already in heaven. So he included in, in his purposes of his kingdom coming in the very fullness of his the description of it in the destruction of his enemies and reestablishing in this earth and its sphere which had been corrupted with his will and that finally in an incorruptible man and in an incorruptible new heavens and earth establish his will. Again. For we know at one point in in creation, God's will was done in all parts of his creation. For it was not in the beginning corrupted. God has ensured man's involvement in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom that is coming, in that he has sent Christ in the form of a man as the second Adam to accomplish this his purpose bringing about his kingdom. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord this day that you're a human being. Praise the Lord. A conscious being that has the ability, the noble ability to decide, to choose, to will, what a, what a wonderful creation we are. What a wonderful creation we are in potential. Thank God. I'm, I'll praise him regardless because it's just a wonderful, worthy reason to praise him. Revelations chapter 11, if you'll turn with me there. I talked to you about um, six months ago or so. I had said that I wanted to, to go into the book of Revelation as often as the Spirit of God would lead us so as to more fully understand the, God's salvation plan, His kingdom coming. Knowing full well that the book of Revelation was written by men moved by a man, John, moved by the Spirit of God that was intended to fill and finally put a period at, at the end of a long dissertation that the Spirit of God had authored from the book of Genesis. And so it being more of an enigma than, than any other book, is its uh, misinterpretation is unlimited. And therefore, being a weaker servant than many of those that have sought the truth in that book, I have 
hesitated in looking at the book at the fear of confusing other relevant, good, easy to be understood scriptures. But having said that, how can you how can you speak the whole counsel of God if you only speak a portion of it? If you're going to talk about the whole counsel of God, then you have to be as a Torah teacher. Uh, as a teacher appointed, you have to have an understanding of the new covenant revelation as it relates to the book of Revelation. That being said, doesn't mean that I have the fullness of understanding in the book of Revelation, but having an understanding of the kingdom coming gives me a leg up on those who have tried to interpret it without the foundation. And I have the benefit of many men Godly, before me, Togeles, Govat, Lang, Pien, all the different great theologians of times past, I have the benefit of their gleaning and digging out uh, solid uh, scriptural truths that align themselves with the remainder of the Word of God. So, <laughs> I again thank the Lord for a fuller understanding of the book of Revelation than I had before. Uh, some 45, 47, 48 years ago. It's the very first place that I really piqued my interest because it was, it was all those titillating facts of prophecy being fulfilled that we were sure that in the 60s and the 70s God would was surely coming back and we we need to be on top of that but having lived through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s I I finally discovered that it will it wasn't imminent it was uh, there was a lot of other things that I need to get my arms around and not that I have gotten my arms totally around those other things yet I feel more confident than ever that I can take that foundational understandings that God has given me in, as it relates to the kingdom of God and I can project that into the book of Revelation with the help of those other men and have a clear interpretation of the word of God to expound to you. That is my hope, that is my prayer. And we have discussed in the last six months, give or take, uh, pretty much in depth, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. You may not recognize it, but we have alluded to those scriptures often over the study. Some in chapter 4, considerable in chapter 12, 14, 20, 21, 22. But there's some gaping holes in there with a lot of doctrine, a lot of teaching, a lot of understanding. And I'd like to just plug in this one bit of information that may resonate with you who are, are, are like me, are connecting the dots for this very sacred time that's coming, the kingdom of God. So in the 11th chapter of Revelation, there's, a, I'll, I'll just read a portion of it, starting with verse 1, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. And then that verse that, that I really would like to speak to that I ran out of time in preparing. I prepared, I wrote, I thought and prayed up to the very moment I ran here. 
and I was wanting to find uh, more scriptural, more scripture references to the two witnesses. But I think for, for the purposes that the Holy Spirit has in mind today, I have enough ammo. Verse number three is, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's 42 months. That's um, three and a half years, right? These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. You know, most of you are familiar with those scriptures in the Old Covenant, a little bit at least in Zechariah and in Nehemiah. Ezra, they have references to those olive trees and to those candlesticks, and then in Psalms also. And if any man will hurt them, so this is a reference to the two witnesses. He is, he is comparing them to two olive trees or two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. There's all sorts of way, uh, there's all sorts of directions that we could go out of these verses, but we're going to, I'm going to try to stay on point. Verse 5, And if any man will hurt them, hurt who? Hurt these two witnesses of God, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Out of their mouth. Fire proceedeth out of their mouth. And devoureth their enemies. I'm of this mind. Anytime the word of God can be taken literally, that is the way to take it. And I literally know in that this can, can happen. Well, we have a, <clears throat> several instances of it in the Old Covenant, fire being called down. And then in the New Covenant, we have a reference to them, John, wanting to call fire down on the city that had rejected them. So there, there is this ability, this power that, from God that can cause fire to proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And it actually happens. As it did in the Old Covenant, so shall it happen in this point of the New Covenant. And one thing I want you to keep in mind here, in your mind, is that this point that we're speaking about here in the 11th chapter of Revelation is three and a half years from the beginning of the tribulation. So we have three and a half years that precede the three and a half years where the Antichrist, the beast, rules and reigns. So we have three and a half years and a three and a half year period. And I want you to think in terms of this aligns with the, this three and a half year period that we're now discussing at the middle of the three and a half year period, the middle of the tribulation, I'm, say, I'm sorry, that at that point, there is a, a, a conclusion to the age and dispensation of mercy and grace, which had been now for 2,000 years, and at that point will we'll conclude, and at that point we'll pick up the age of judgment. The age of judgment and justice. And that's why we will see here in their ministry, these two witnesses' ministry, and a departing from grace and mercy dispensation to the age of justice, holiness, and judgment. So these are two old covenant, new covenant related witnesses or testifying of God. And here at this point, more specifically, testifying to the promises of God to Israel. So we see an old covenant, now made new covenant, because God has tied them together. He has owned the old covenant right here in that old covenant justice, the law. And he shows where these two witnesses devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. 
and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Here we have an allusion to, to Egypt, don't we? And to smite the earth and those two witnesses, right? Moses and Aaron. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So whenever they willed, they could, but by the power that was bestowed upon them, by the authority that was bestowed upon them, whenever they willed, they could call a devouring fire, a turning of water to blood, or other plagues. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, that is, after this three and a half year period, the beast, we're talking about a 42 months, right? The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall be in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's not difficult to discern what city that's relating to by that last statement. Jerusalem. These men minister, at least at the end of their ministry, they minister in Jerusalem and that there is in the, their presence this beast that ascendeth out of the pit, the bottomless pit, that they confront and they are then killed and lay in the streets of the holy city of Jerusalem. Three and a half. And they are the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations. And this going back to Brandy's reading that scripture in the 25th chapter of Matthew shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. Isn't that like the Lord? You know, is in a cloud. And their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was... The same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. In the Greek that is men of renown or men of name seven thousand which you can just translate that in any way you want to as it relates to maybe one in ten Maybe that, that is 7,000. Or maybe it's one in a hundred. These are, these are certain men. These are men that have a name. These 7,000. The death and the destruction is not limited to 7,000 is what I'm trying to say. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second, listen, they gave glory to the God of heaven. You remember Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh, he, he, he gave glory to God, didn't he? Finally, who is this God? I don't know this God, and I won't obey him. But in the end, after the firstborn were killed, he said to Moses and Aaron, pray for me. See, finally, he gave glory unto this God. But was it a lasting glory? 
Was it a lasting reverential type of fear? Or was it just a momentary fear of the supernatural event that happened? Wasn't long before he reasoned that this that he had seen for whatever reason was not really the glorious God that he had thought. And here we have the same thing playing out again. We have in the, in the eyes of those that beheld who were called the enemies of the prophets raised up and brought into heaven probably even hearing the audible voice come up hither of fear and of falling on their face and giving glory unto God. But shortly thereafter, we find later that they completely turn away from this God that did this act in front of their very faces. And then the verse 14 is very telling in the timetable of the tribulation in that the second woe is past. So at the time of this angel revealing this from the first verse in chapter 11, of revealing the measuring of this temple and the city and the outward court, from that time, there was the ending of the second woe and the beginning of the third woe. Verse 14, The second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded. The seventh angel sounded. And if you go back and you look, you'll find the sixth angel sounded. And when the sixth angel sounded, it was a trumpet. So here we have the seventh trumpet, the seventh angel sounding the seventh trumpet. And so we have seals, trumpets, vials or bowls, right? Seven, seven, seven. Here we have the the end of the trumpets sounding. The seventh one is sounding. So, what am I saying? I say correlating the, second, the seventh trumpet with the end of the second woe is the beginning of the third woe at the seventh trumpet. You got that? It's, it's common sense, but you have to think about it a moment. And the beginning of the third woe and the seventh trumpet sounding is at the point where he, John, is, ta- is, is commanded to take up a reed and a rod to do the measuring. And the seventh angel, verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Here the third woe begins. This is where the vials begin. Verse 16 says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshipped God. There was... A revelation to these elders that caused them to fall on their faces and worship God. And they said, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. What were they angry? They're angry with the, with the testimony of those two witnesses. They were angry at all of the woe that was brought about by the mouths of those prophets. The nations were angry, and their wrath has come. And the time of the dead. The nations were angry, and thy wrath, God's wrath, is come. And also, besides his wrath has come, the time of the dead. That they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name. You see that? Three categories there. They are thy servants, the prophets, 
and to the saints and them that fear thy name, shall small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. These, these destroyers. Who are those destroyers? Those destroyers are those fallen angels. We can lay the, the destruction of the earth at the feet of the satanic forces. Yes, man has collaborated, but the genesis is from the fallen angels. I hear your question, and I'm going to answer it. Let me finish these two verses, two, one verse. Great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen. See, this is an allusion to a, so something opening up in heaven, and there was seen in the, in the temple because of the opening up of the temple, there was seen the ark of his, the Lord's testament, you know, his, his will, his covenant. The, the, there, there is a copy of that as there was a copy of the law in the ark, which was the type. There is a copy of a testament that is in the holy temple, in the ark, that relates to the will of, of the Lord, his inheritance. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now, what, what the, answer, the, the short answer, Luke, to what, what Scripture relates is that so Luke 16, I already gave an example of Egypt and the supernatural things that they were confronted with that did not change their hearts. Now, you can go to Luke 16 and you can find in the story of the rich man and Lazarus who died and went to Hades, you can find an allusion there of the rich man interceding with Abraham and asking him to send someone back from the dead to reveal this place that he was in to his brothers lest they come there. And they and he, Abraham, said to him, if they didn't believe Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't believe someone that appeared from the dead to them. The, the reality is that there will be those that the message resonates to. That is a reality. There will be those on the earth that the message will resonate to. God's mercy and grace is still up to this point, alive and working. And they will have been a witness 
or a testimony for the last three and a half years. Maybe not to the degree where they have been exposed to the entire world as these two witnesses, but they will have been in a mission. They will have a mission. They will have a testimony and a purpose that is aligned with the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. The 12,000 from each tribe are separated out from among the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation as a whole rejects the Messiah. And these 12,000 of each tribe are aligning themselves with a Messiah that the Jews reject. And in the while that these 144,000 are being led by, I'll use that word lightly, led at least spiritually by these two witnesses, they are, have a message that also does not align themselves with Christian community. The Christian community rejects the kingdom of Christ in the, in the terms that the word presents it and in the terms that the 144,000 will be presenting it. And it will be cause a great enmity between Christian community and the 144,000. So this 144,000 that have as their leaders, spiritually at least, the two witnesses are set against naturally by the Christian community. They're set naturally against by the Jewish community. And they are naturally then, of course, set at enmity with the Muslim community. So these, these two witnesses, these testify a message that is unacceptable on this religious earth in the last days. That's why and how that when these prophets bring forth these actions, whatever they might be, they'll be, as they were in Egypt, called something different than what they are. Phenomenon, natural phenomenon, or whatever their reasoning. But on that side of it, they have another force or power who has been given a, uh, a mandate from the whole entire earth because of his supernatural abilities. And if they do this, if the sorcerers did, if, if Moses and Aaron did this, the sorcerers did that. So whatever, whatever credibility that might have been because of their, the two witnesses' abilities supernaturally to cause these things to come to pass by the words of their mouth, there are those others that counter what it is that they do. Representing that they are the right way, these guys are imposters, and by declaring war and God allowing them to be killed by this Antichrist, by this beast that comes up and ascends out of the pit, it has added credibility to the rest of the world that they were not of God. Does that kind of... It, it, it works toward that answering. You still wonder, how is it that they... How is it that Pharaoh couldn't, uh, couldn't repent? Because the message is becoming... Uh, more and more darkened, less acceptable because of the influences of the world. We, we like to think that we're progressing and growing, but in reality, in many ways, we're digressing. Christianity certainly is digressing. It's becoming blended. It's not hardly different than any other religion now. And we'd like to think when we're confronted with these things, oh, we'll recognize them so readily and clearly and we'll turn from our wicked ways. And some will, but few. Not a great deal. Narrow is the path. And if you've waited that long to become convinced of the things of God, you're pretty dull of hearing. And if you do turn from your wicked ways, there's going to be a tremendous amount of accountability and responsibility to you in this last three and a half year period where you will be praying to die. Trying to, to be faithful. 
It's a very wicked time, but it's not that far. And it doesn't have to go very much further because it's exponential. Kathy? Kathy, in line, in line with what you're saying, that last verse 19, it says when the ark of his testament is revealed, there's lightnings and voices, voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hell. The testament of Christ has those stipulations that you're speaking of. It is the just judgment of God being played out upon the earth. The testament of Jesus gives the full recompense of reward, be it good or be it bad. And that is what's brought to bear upon the earth. The testimony of his testament is a, is a, uh, a condemnation of those who have rejected it and refused it. Therefore, come the judgments of God. And at this period, three and a half years into the tribulation, with three and a half years yet to go, that is the severeness of God will be fully represented for that time of grace and mercy that we live in now. Had, that door has closed. God's not expecting then a, a uh, turning from their wicked ways. It's purely and completely punitive and destructive. What is con completely punitive and destructive? The judgments of God. This is that clear point of, of, of uh, that we can point to as that clear point that, that stops the one age and begins the other age. Amen? Well, going back to my notes, Revelation chapter 11, first, first page, three-fourths of the way down, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11, 15, we read, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. This is that scripture that Brandy alluded to in the separating of the nations. This is the goats and the sheep. This is Christ pouring out His judgments the recompense of all things, and Him separating unto His own kingdom the sheep. And He shall reign forever and ever. This corresponds to Revelations 12.10. If you'll just turn over there, if you're still there. Revelations 12.10 10 says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. So this proclamation in the 11th chapter of Revelation is the same moment that verse 10 of chapter 12 is in that he heard a loud voice in heaven, Now is come salvation. That is the kingdoms becoming the kingdoms of Christ and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accursed them before our God. So we have a simultaneous uh, action here that is alluded to in chapter 12, 
that is introduced in chapter 11. What am I saying? I'm saying that chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14 of Revelation are interposed. They are parenthetical insertions. They are expoundings on what is happening during this time of Revelation chapter 11 where the angels throw, the elders throw down on their faces and worship God and proclaim what a wonderful, awesome, powerful God you are. And now the kingdoms have become your kingdoms. What does that mean? Well, the 12th and the 13th and 14th chapter expounds on that which happens at the first in chapter 11. That's, that's why the 12.10 verts back and it's the same as that scripture that's found in chapter 11 because it's at the same time. It just expounds on exactly what happens here. What happens when, what happened that caused the angels to fall on their faces and worship God? Something happened. Something that, that alluded to the temple in heaven. Something that opened up and showed them a a information gave them understanding uh, of, of what God's awesome plan was. This is that, that place where angels wanted, they, they desired to look into the things of God, but they couldn't see them. This is that place where in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, 10, I believe, where it says that, uh, that these things are going to be revealed unto the principalities and powers by the church. That's, that's what's happening here in the 11th chapter of Revelation. Chapter 15 picks up again, at the end of chapter 15, it picks up again with that revealing of the temple. Verse 8, 15, 8 says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. These, that's what I meant by that at the end of verse of, of the chapter 11, we find the beginning of the vials. It's a simultaneous action. The end of the second woe, the beginning of the third woe, which is the pouring out of the vials, begins here where the angels now proclaim something awesome has transpired. The awesomeness, let me just cut to the chase. The awesomeness included a rapture of some saints into a heavenly sphere that rocks the very foundational understandings of the elders of the church. The elders have the heavenly church. It rocked their understanding what God has done. They are proclaiming the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come. Now we see how it is that the kingdom of God is brought into being. The fullness of time has come for that proclaiming. It is now time for heavenly might to be exercised over unwilling heavenly and earthly unwilling forces. You know, these things are so real to me, they are as if they happened. Are they, dear? I mean, they, to me, they, are, they have already happened in my mind. I already see these things transpiring. It's not difficult for me to relate to these things because I see them as happening. And that is the prophetic spirit of John. He wrote these things in the, as if they were happening or as if they would happen tomorrow or for sure uh, at a time uh, in the future, but they, to him, happened. Even though they hadn't happened yet, to him, because he had this vision, they had happened. He knows that's exactly what's going to happen, and he could mourn, and he could weep as if it happened. That's what I feel. I feel I see these things having happened, even though they haven't happened. And I can mourn, and I can... I can feel, I can, I can hurt, I can rejoice at the same time. I can rejoice in the, the good and I can mourn in the bad. And you should be able to find yourself in here because it is understanding these things 
That gives us our incentive today to live in a Christian manner in order that we might ensure that we be partakers of this kingdom coming. It is now time for heavenly might to be exercised over unwilling heavenly and earthly unwilling forces, both the spiritual realm of the fallen wicked and the wicked men who have followed them to destroy those destroyers who have destroyed the earthly realm. And to reward, it speaks in terms of rewarding those three entities or three groups, the servants of the prophets, verse 18, and to the saints and to them that fear God. The great events of chapter 5 are now realized. That which the elders foresaw has here now taken effect. What, what is he saying now? This is hard for me to describe because all of it is in the future and none of this has happened. Yet when the angels, let's say the elders that are the angels, when the elders in the chapter 5 had seen the throne being set up and Christ the Lamb being on the throne, when they had seen that, they had not yet experienced what was going to happen a few years later, three and a half years later, presumably, they had not yet seen that. But now, having three and a half years transpired from the setting up of the throne, the judgment seat of Christ in the heavenly realm above, now they begin, now they see, after three and a half more years, what it was that that was representative of. Wow. I wish I could draw a picture about that right there because that is giving the future at a certain moment, explaining it to no great degree, showing what will happen that will, will uh, relate to the salvation of the world and man through the Lamb on the throne, but not giving a whole lot of detail as it relates to what happens around that. And then moving in time, three and a half years later, to a point where you now are expounding on what, what happens, what will happen after that which will happen, happens. <laughs> Are, 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 you, are you, is that clear at all? In other words, the vision has, is alluding to different points of time in the future. And this particular point of time in the future in chapter 5 of Revelation that the elders see, they don't see in complete manner or fashion what they will see and experience in the period shortly after that that John speaks of about another time in future that's future to that future. Is that any better? So, go ahead, because you might, you might have something that, yeah, I do. And, um, that helps I people understand that. Yeah, it, that's what I meant by this is <clears throat> chapters 12, 13, and 14 are parenthetical. It means that it's not in chronological order. You don't stop in 11 and go to 12. You now see, well, the things that happened after 11 are, tw are in 12, and things that happened after 12 are in 13, and, and things that happened after chapter 13 are in chapter 14. That is not the way it works, and that it is, chapter 11 is an event that 
chapters 12, 13, and 14 expound upon. They're both very close to, a, to the same time. And when they're in chapter 11, that, they, that it is said of these angels that they had a, a brief look or an opening into heaven, and there was seen the temple, the Ark of the Testament, and there were these lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail, that doesn't give us a lot of detail. But if you go into chapter 12, you can find out just exactly what that meant. What happened? What happened to cause these angels, these elders, to fall on their faces? What happened for them to declare, now the kingdom is coming? Now the kingdom has come. Now you have shown us what it is that you're really doing. It's kind of like the disciples there in John chapter 15 where they say, now you're speaking plainly to us and we understand now plainly. Before they couldn't understand what he was saying. But now, now this ha this, these events are revealing plainly what it is that God had intended from the beginning. Let me move on before I continue to confuse you. So these the events of chapter 5 are now being realized in chapter 12, 13, and 14. That which the elders foresaw as here now taken effect. Authority is transferred to Jesus the Christ and to his servants found faithful. <clears throat> That in chapter 5, where they cast their crowns at the feet, that is representative of understanding that their authority has been transferred. And that this amazing thing that's transpiring in the 11th chapter of Revelation includes the transferring of the power from the elders as it relates to reigning and ruling on the earth under the auspices of God, now those powers transfer from them to Christ and His bride. Here in this verse, in this chapter, we see the much heralded blowing of the seventh trumpet and its following series of events that cover the extent of time from the end of the second woe till the end of the third woe, that is to say, the beginning of the pouring out of the seven vials through the millennial reign. I said it before, and I used a very poor example of the seventh trumpet being a trumpet, not a... Not a one note and stop. Beep. That's not the seventh trumpet. That's not the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The sounding of the tra tr seventh trumpet continues. <laughs> However it sounds, it continues, and it's a long sounding trumpet that in, act in spiritually speaking covers the fullness of time through the millennium. Because the millennium at the end of the millennium, we have the fullness of the judging of all of those that are dead and the ending of that age of justice. And it's that seventh trump that blows that it ushers in that beginning, but it doesn't end, the seventh trumpet doesn't end until after the millennial period, after the great white throne judgment, and that time that it goes into the eighth day which is eternity. I wrote there, Revelations 11, 13, 14, with Revelation 16, 1, just as, just as let you have a scripture reference as to why it is that the vials, pouring out of the vials, um, corresponds with the seventh trump. The seventh trumpet sounding corresponds to all the events following and the specific time of realizing 
what has been shrouded mystery and enigma in the heavens. Suddenly the temple of God in heaven is opened, verse 19, and the ark of his testament, Christ's covenant, testament, is now more clearly seen by heavenly beings as his purposes now unfold in spectacular fashion as Christ with the temple, the ark, and the altar begins claiming his ground in the heaven above the earth, they then fall upon their faces and worship God. I'll put a disclaimer in here. I know no one that teaches this. And so therefore take it uh, knowing that I'm talking about this specific illusion here. This specific illusion to an event that I believe corresponds with the taking up of the, of the tabernacle, the temple, and the ark, and all those heavenly utensils, and the outer court, and taking all of that <clears throat> and moving it according to the Spirit of God. When the cloud moved, they moved. That's why I drew your attention to that ascension of uh, those, those witnesses in the clouds. is the same way the Lord was uh, witnessed to as he went up in clouds. Well, I'm, I'm suggesting to you that the cloud and this revelation of seeing into the temple is corresponding to that of Christ coming out of the temple. The opening up and the revealing of the ark is nothing more than God saying it is time, Jesus, to move into the fullness of your, your ministry. The, the finality of your ministry in fulfilling the calling of kingdom coming. It's now time. Now the temple in heavenly in the heavenly realm is open, and the revealing of the ark is the, is the witness and the testimony of Jesus Christ moving into his Melchizedek ministry. <laughs> Which you'll have to get a picture from the Lord in that, <clears throat> that the ark and the altar move with him. You'll see that in the very first verse, we said, And there was given me a reed like unto rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. And you'll, re you'll relate to other scriptures in the revelations that speak about the judgments that come from the altar. You'll, you'll learn of, uh, you'll read of, <coughs> of the souls of the martyrs who are below the altar. All of these are allusions to a time, a specific time, when Christ comes out from the holiest of holy places on the throne of God and he now moves into his throne, on his throne, in a heavenly sphere above the earth where he now moves into the Melchizedek ministry of both prophet, priest, and king. And in this, we'll find the testimony, the witness of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that's the spectacular. That's the glorious. That's what causes these elders to get up off their seats and fall upon their faces and worship God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And if you move into the 12th chapter at that expounding of what happens, you find that at least the first fruits offering in the man child caught up into that heavenly realm where Christ descends to and where he now is beginning to set up his throne in the order of Melchizedek where he and the first fruits now, along with the angels of God, remove the forces from that that area, the heavenly realm, and cast them down to the earth. You find that in the 12th chapter. But it is in the 11th chapter that the elders see it and received it as something that now experienced what it was that was only, only seen in partial understanding in the 5th chapter of Revelation. As I wrote here, this 
Ark of His Testament is an allusion to Christ moving from that His heavenly throne seat with the Father unto His own throne in the heavenly realm above the earth. This is what is seen by those elders who at, to that point had had a certain authority in this realm as those appointed as the uh, overseers of the earth and its spirit, heavenly kingdom, of which the, 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 the fallen angels represent 12 more. These are 24 elders. In total, there's 36. And it is these elders that remain, the 24, in that heavenly authority that now give unto God, seeing His salvation plan through the Messiah in taking His place in authority. He, they now lay those thrones of authority in which God now distributes unto whom He will. In this new heavenly dynamic. The rod of measurement represents a separating the holy from the profane, but tying the heavenly realm to the earthly. This reed, this rod that is that the one is instructed to measure with for the temple, for the city, for the outer court, this is for the purpose of separating the profane from that that's holy. The reed represents the measuring of the heavenly temple area. The rod represents that which is given up to the unholy. The rod, with its measurements, is given up unto the Gentiles. For it is unto them that the outer court and the city is given into their hands. But the temple, the temple is holy and unprofane. Why? Because it's not on the earth. It's in the heavenly realm. What is being measured on the earth is the outer court and the city of Jerusalem. But what has been measured in heaven is the temple and the altar. In the heaven of heavens? No. In the heavenly place now where Christ has moved His authority now, taking over this realm because we're moving toward, quickly moving toward the millennial reign. And now it's woe, woe, woe unto those on the earth for Satan in the 12th chapter has been cast down while the man-child has been raised up. And he says, I know my time is short. So this rod that he's been given to measure with separates God's holy justice and judgment and he, he only... Uh, focuses his judgment upon that that is profane. The temple is not profane. It is holy. It is in the heavenly realm. For if it was in Jerusalem, it would be unholy. Because Israel has turned to Egypt and they are likened unto Sodom. We just read it. They're not holy. The temple is not holy. If they were going, if God was going to judge the temple in the earth, it would be judged along with the outer court and the city. But it's not. It's reserved. It's reserved because it's holy and it's in the heavenly realm where Christ now resides. The rod represents that which is given up to the unholy. That which is measured and given up unto the Gentiles for 42 months is the outer court and the city of Jerusalem. In effect, the outer court and the city becoming the temple or holy place as it relates to the Jew. 
in which Daniel's abomination of desolation then may transpire. Uh, I, I should have my chalkboard out so I could draw this for you. No, but I will draw it for you. I'm suggesting to you that this rod and reed are measurements that measure out the temple, the altar, the outer court, and the city. And the reason that it's being measured is because God is fixing to pour out His punitive punishment upon the Gentile nations, upon the rebellious, which also include Israel. Unless there be a mistake, only that that's profane will receive the judgments, the just judgments of God, and that will be where the Gentiles are and the rebellious Israel remain. Yet there is a holy altar and a holy temple and a holy throne and a holy priesthood and a holy king. And they are in the realm or the sphere of this earth, but they're not on the earth. And if that, that is a true interpretation or one that is close, then that could mean that Daniel's desolation, abomination of desolation, that of the holy place, could be in the outer court, not in the holy of holies, as we have thought. Does anybody? You're shaking your head like this, like you're kind of getting it. I, I appreciate that because I feel like I'm talking... I'm not, and it's not a reflection on your aptitude again. It's a reflection on my ability to, to make a point. God help me make a point in a shorter amount of time. I'm suggesting to you, and I draw it on a picture. Here's the Holy of Holies and the outer court. The holy place and the outer court is on the earth. Whereas the Holy of Holies is in the heavenly realm. Not in heaven, but in the heavenly realm now because that's where Christ moved to. He's now not in heaven. He has a heavenly ha uh, temple has been opened and now we perceive the Ark of the Testament. Now it is being moved. Do you need Old Covenant example of the Ark moving? I wouldn't think not. That is the outer court. So in the outer court, in the Holy of Holies is right above the earth, the outer court and the holy place is on the earth. That's the city and all of the Gentiles. They're all, there is a place in the outer court. We just read it that the, is given unto the Gentiles. Why? Because God's judgment will come upon them because of their hearts. They aren't in Alignment with the Holy of Holies or the outward court or the holy place. They stand in opposition to God. And because they have been brought into the outer court, they have brought themselves into the outer court. They are now subject to the judgments that come upon the heathen. In a way, I have, but I haven't. Yes, yes. Yes, standing up. That standing up and down, outer court, holy of holies, uh, the holy place. I have drawn it up and straight up and down. And I have bordered on talking about this, but this is the first time that I've really just come out and said clear what I am talking about when I draw this drawing. I'm suggesting to you that the holy place is a place That, that is, could be a place that is called the outer court in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And if the outer court is the holy place, I'm suggesting that Daniel, Daniel and Jesus' words about the abomination of desolation can happen in the outer court. Because that's the area that has been designated unto the Jews and the Gentiles. 
Who goes into the heavenly uh, holy of holies? The priests. Who are the priests? The bride. Kathy. I speak to that here in this lesson somewhere. I remember typing it. So I'll say the comment to that, only I'll agree with you right now, Kathy, and then I'll say the comment because I have, I know I wrote it in here somewhere. And kind of like this book is not in chronological order, it's kind of like the way my teaching is. It's not necessarily in any chronological order. I'm trying to make a point or points. The point and the points are what is Christ, what did Christ mean when he said, Thy kingdom come? What was his, what was God's mission from the before the foundations of the earth? What was the mission, the total mission of Jesus Christ as it relates to men and angels? And that impact, more than any of that, to those that this would resonate with, is the impact. Uh, that would bring a stronger resolve to draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit in the forming of our character so that we might be participants in this kingdom coming. That's, that's the purpose, not to titillate, not to bring about some, you know, some doctrines of new doctrine or anything. It's simply for the purpose to open up our scriptural eyes to see more clearly and to bring ourselves into a place with the help of the Holy Spirit to be used in service to, to working toward the, the same end that God is. Instead of crosswise in our life so much with Jesus' purposes that we could get in harmony with Him and work with Him in prayer and in service, in actual deed. You didn't believe me that I wasn't going to use this. For the time of final judgment has come. With, with the two, testi uh, the two uh, testifiers, the two witnesses of God and, and for Israel having now being revealed or manifested on the earth, now the final judgment of Israel has come. That final three and a half year period focuses on two things. Judgment poured out on Gentiles and judgment poured out on rebellious, refusing the Messiah, Israel. John has now apprehended both. That which is now sealed in judgment and the two safe places. There's two safe places here that Paul, or I'm sorry, that John writes of. The first one is in the heavenly temple, wherein are those who have been kept. You understand the word kept there, I'm sure, from, from the Philadelphians, I believe, in the third chapter uh, of Revelation, where it says they'll be kept from that time of trial and testing that will come on the whole earth. Whatever, wherever that is in the first three chapters of Revelation. That's who's there. That's who's in worship now. Do you know that I'm quoting this scripture, right? You, you know that I'm trying to, to give you uh, uh, the first verse. It says, and made the temple and the altar, and them that worship therein. Those that worship therein include those that have been kept from that which is about to come on the earth in the last three and a half years. And that one safe place is in that heavenly realm that is now being established above the earth in Jesus and his resurrected co-ruling bride, now after the order of Melchizedek in his kingship throne and his priestly temple with the ark of his covenant, now finally being realized in the heavenly calling. See, the Holy of Holies is in the heavens. The Holy of Holies will always be in the heavens. with the ark of his covenant now finally being realized in the heavenly calling. The Hebrews chapter 3, 1. 
The heavenly calling calls to a priesthood that is able to go into a heavenly holy of holies. Oh, where am I going? I'm going to the resurrection. I'm going to the resurrection of the body, the glorifying of the, of the soul of man. That's where I'm going here. So John sees this one safe place as that heavenly place that, that uh, accompanies the heavenly, heavenly calling. While on the earth, the tribes of Israel return. They return back to Israel. The temple of the old covenant will be rebuilt and priesthood and sacrifices restored. It will be owned as a part of the new covenant, yet be the inferior to the heavenly as the old covenant temple is now the outer court of the new covenant. Okay, you, you brought it out, so. Something like this, I don't know. This is uh, Holy of Holies. This is, this is the holy place. Outer court. When God separates his sheep from the goats, the earth, when he separates the sheep from the goats, the Holy of Holies will remain in the heavenly sphere where Christ will rule and reign from with his bride. The, the temple now being re, will be then rebuilt on the earth, but that temple will, even though it will have a holy place, it will, it will be, in essence, the outer court or the outer, the holy place as opposed to the holy of holies. In other words, the, the real priesthood, of the higher priesthood of the heavenly calling is a heavenly priesthood that will rule and reign with Christ over the earth where the seed of Abraham will rebuild the temple upon the earth, but it will have the sacrifices and the worship, but it's inferior to that that is in the heavenly realm. That in itself is at least one lesson to, to, to really to show that in Scripture. Forgive me for moving on because I, I'm, I have a tendency to try to teach everything in one lesson. And I just, I, it's impossible. So I just want to move on. I'm relating to you these two safe places that John saw. And we find them in the 12th chapter of Revelation. The, the one safe place is the catching up of the man child. The man child. Is, is at least, if not more, is at least the first fruits offering to God in Christ. And that's the rapture. That's the man child being caught up. That's the safe place. That's being kept. That's being kept from this that is about to transpire upon the earth. That that's about to transpire on the earth is because of the death of those two tests the last two witnesses of God. Let me try to hold my train of thought for one, just through the sentence, because I'll forget where I was at. I'm trying to talk to you about the two safe places. The one safe place being here, the other safe place being in the wilderness. Right? Isn't that where Jesus said to flee to the nation of Israel? Well, the one group is caught up by rapture. The other group is remaining on the earth. That of the Gentile Abrahamic seed, little s. Big S seed, caught up. Little seed, get out. Get out into the wilderness. When you see these things happening, the abomination of the desolation, the death of the two witnesses, if nothing else, get out. Get out into the wilderness. That's the other safe place that John alludes to in the 12th chapter of uh, Revelation.
it's, if I'm understanding your question, wh what has happened here is that Israel rejected the heavenly call. And they re rejected the heavenly temple calling. There still is the promised temple calling to the seed of Abraham that will be fulfilled in the millennial thousand year period when they'll take preeminence in the earth. But the judgment of the nation of Israel is the loss of the heavenly calling, which went to another nation more, that will bring forth the fruits thereof, the nation of the new creation. So that is the judgment that has come on the temple on the earth. Now, what I was suggesting a minute ago was <clears throat> that that the outer court is an outer court in the holy place is being measured by a rod, and the rod measures the outer court, the the holy place, the temple. I mean, not the temple, but the city. This is given up unto the Gentiles. And if this represents now where the Jews are in the outer court, in the, in the city, the holy city, then the abomination of desolation doesn't need to be in a temple, a restored temple. It, it is in essence where the abomination of desolation will be the 42 months of the Gentiles walking and treading all over the holy place, which is the city of the outer court. It will be rebuilt, as Ezekiel says, by the Messiah after the return of the Messiah, Yeshua. In the beginning of the millennial period, 1,000 years. Therein will also the, the festivals the sacrifices and the priesthood be reinstituted. But it's all inferior now. Inferior, although it's in preeminence in the earth, it's inferior as to the heavenly calling wherein Christ now rules and reigns from the heavenly place through the heaven to the earth, out through the holy place, because this will be made holy, right? At the moment, it's not holy. We've re we read the reason He is separated is this is profane, this is holy. But this will be made holy. When the Messiah returns and they receive Jesus Christ, there will be a fountain opened up. This will be made holy. And at that time, it is the holy place in the outer court as it relates to the original tabernacle and the holy of holies remains in the heavenly place. The Antichrist will have been a, a part or a great deal or portion of his, uh, his goals is to take control of Israel, including Jerusalem. And whether he actually sets up his, his place of headquarters there, it seems that he does, but I wouldn't say that, that that's a, an actual scriptural fact. We know that it is he that comes up from the bottomless pit that kills those two witnesses in the city of Jerusalem. So, I was just making a practical assumption, he is in Jerusalem, and he does kill those two. Literally, they kill those two witnesses. I hope this is beginning to make a little more sense to you. So those two safe places, <coughs> the heavenly place, where those are caught up to, where one will be on the, one at the mill, two at the mill, one be caught up, one be left, one's on the rooftop, one in the bed. Th that had to do with no action on your own. That's a passive action of being worthy, watchful, ready, waiting. And then the other is the actual word to the Jewish contingent that they who were left would flee. They had an action. The one was passive. The one had an action. The other group had an action. Get thee out of Jerusalem. 
So these are the two safe places. I wrote here, as it was always the shadow of the heavenly. Old Covenant Temple is now the outer court of the New Covenant. As it was always the shadow of the heavenly, this being established in Scripture, even this temple of the heavenly realm does not endure forever, but gives way to the New Jerusalem descending from heaven. How many of you are totally confused? <laughs> not totally? Well, good, because the endeavor is as we have moved over along in these six months, is to keep touching, have our touchstone being in the book of Revelation so that, and we can go in and out of the book of Revelation until we get a thorough understanding of the book. And we all should understand that what I mean by this heavenly holy of holies, this throne of Christ, the Messiah, is only temporary itself. Because it gives way to the new Jerusalem, right? Where there is neither temple. There's no temple, right? You should know this, right? Shake your head and say, yeah, that's right. I understand, Mike. That's what it says in the books. Especially in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. We have that replacing of this dynamic completely by the new Jerusalem coming to the earth wherein there is no temple. So this is... This is this is that that represents the seventh day. This is the seventh day. Uh, I want to get one of these right upside down. It would be a great invention. This is the seventh day, and then we have the eighth day coming. The eighth day is the new Jerusalem. The new city. That, you know, what is it? Is it 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles? Something like that? 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles? Yeah, it's a heavenly city. That's where Abraham and those others looked for a heavenly city. Okay. And, and then the two witnesses. I back, bounce back to the two witnesses. They, they are the ministers of the outer court. They are prophets who and messengers of mercy to Israel. They lead the 144,000 sealed below as the Lamb leads those 144,000 above. We, we're kind of familiar with that. 144,000, 12,000 beast tribe. But there's an additional 144,000 that aren't of Israel. They are spoken of in the 14th chapter of Revelations as well as the 5th and 6th chapter. These two witnesses are the two olive trees. They were, by that I mean, and I just made myself a note, they were live at Zechariah's vision when Zechariah said, not, you know, not by spirit or not by might or power, but by the Spirit of God. Paraphrase the Mike Balloon edition. That's not exactly right, but you know what I'm talking about. It's when God revealed under Zechariah the two witnesses, the two olive branches. And he said, these are my two witnesses in there. Hey, they were alive. They were alive. Who is they? Who are these two witnesses? They're Elijah and Enoch. The only two men that have lived and not ever died. They are the faithful two witnesses. They were alive at the time of Zechariah, even though they had ascended in times past before Zechariah. So when the Lord was referring to them in Zechariah, to Zechariah, know you not who these are? Do you remember? Read it. He refers to the two witnesses who are, is the reference is, the idea is, you should know who they are. Why? Because it's the two that have lived before, who still are alive, who caught up. Uh, were found to be faithful, and God, they found favor in God's eyes, and God took them, raised them up, ascended them. 
Hey, you're going to have to connect some of these dots yourself. Their ministry as witnesses of God was for three and a half years concurrent with the first three and a half years of the tribulation or Jacob's trouble. The two witnesses having power to torment call down plagues upon the rebellious of Israel. In type, and on, on Gentiles, in type, there was Moses and Aaron were the two faithful witnesses sent to Pharaoh. And not only that, there's other, there's other examples. There's the examples of Joshua, if you'll remember, when he was getting ready to cross over the Jordan, he sent two, two witnesses. Remember how they were hidden in the house of Rahab? The harlot, guess how many days? And then they, they went to the mountaintop, and then they proceeded down to Joshua. They're, they're also a type and a shadow of these two witnesses. There's others. I love the way God doesn't say a lot of things. He just says a few things in a lot of ways. I love it. It's so, because once you can start getting uh, the, the foundational truths, you can, you can see well, how these things allude to the same thing. That's how you can interpret Scripture with Scripture. You don't have to dream up stuff. You can just take Scripture and compare it to Scripture, and here it is. The two witnesses having power to torment call down plagues upon the rebellious of the earth, really, Israel as well. In type, Moses and Aaron were two faithful witnesses sent to Pharaoh. They tormented the Egyptians. Enoch and Elijah shall come before the great and terrible day of the Lord to torment the rebellious inhabitants of the earth in the face of the beast. You remember when the Lord, they were asked if John was Elijah. They knew that Elijah was to come before the great and mighty day of the Lord, right? So they thought John was Elijah. And the Lord said, well, he is Elijah in type. He is. But he was another faithful witness to that what? That, that be, he ended up being beheaded, being killed. He was a witness. Huh? And he ended up being killed, as these two witnesses are. But he was not Elijah, but certainly Elijah will come in the flesh. He come in the flesh because he's never died. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry these things are... that I'm not better at explaining them and understanding them myself. He infuri they infuriate the beast. The wild beast. I don't know if I say it. Yeah, I do here. Can I see I said it right here? Maybe I don't. Just in case I don't, I'll say it because while it's in my mind or I'll forget it. You know, yeah, I do. I remember I, I wrote it now. I remember how I wrote it. So now as it relates to the, the beast, and I'll come back. It'll, it's later in here. I'll I'll uh, read what it was that I was thinking just now. There have been three instances of ascent into the heavens. Scriptures bear it out. Enoch, Elijah, and Jesus. Enoch and Elijah have never suffered death. The highest form of ascent is after death in the power of eternal glory-filled resurrection life. That's the, the highest form of ascent. The ascent in which Elijah and Enoch went up in was in a flesh state, not in a resurrection state. So their ascent was not of the highest form. There's only one who's ascended in the highest form. How is it that he ascended in the highest form of the resurrection of the newness of life? Because he was resurrected. He experienced death and then he was resurrected out from among the dead. Yeah. Not all of them were resurrected. Only Christ was resurrected. The rest remain where they lay. Save two. These two faithful witnesses. Here you can go to Joshua and Caleb if you want. These two faithful witnesses, Enoch 
and Elijah are those that God has set about and set aside for this time to tie the new covenant and the old covenant together in resurrection power. Paul experienced an ascent, but later he was concerning himself about being worthy for the resurrection, the first resurrection. That was a lower form of ascent. He was caught away into heaven. He was also caught over into paradise. Caught away is actually the literal Greek. Caught away into paradise. But he was also caught up, or caught away into heaven. Where is he? But that was a lower form of ascent. It, it was a, it's proved to be a lower form of ascent because it did not work a saving salvation life out of him in the resurrection life or form. Because he feared yet that he later might not be a part of the first resurrection from among the dead. Philippians 3, you all know that. There have been resurrections from the dead wherein those who experienced it died again, such as Lazarus. Their resurrection wasn't in this highest form. It wasn't in the highest form that only one has experienced. There's only been one ascent of the highest experience, Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, out from among the dead. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us, every man in his own order will be resurrected. Some not in the highest form of resurrection. For the word of God says some will be resurrected and still be subject to the second death. The highest form of resurrection or the highest form of ascending is in the first resurrection wherein now if you have qualified worthy of that resurrection, the second death has no... Somebody tell me. The second has no effect on you. So we're talking about the two witnesses that now we're looking to to testify of God in the earth. Enoch and Elijah ascended into heavens before death and to be perfect they must die and then be resurrected in the power of Christ's resurrected life. See where that's going, don't you? They were struck down, right, by the by the one that ascended out of the bottomless pit. He kills these two that had not before experienced death, although they had experienced ascending into a heavens, into the heavens. So they must now die and then be resurrected in the power of Christ's resurrected life. Death is a curse, the result of sin. Death is the curse of God. God cursed us. And it's the result of our sin. Resurrection from among the dead in the power of a newness of life afforded in Jesus Christ is the proof of worthiness in incorruption not subject to further death. And the word says, and when they shall have finished their testimony after three and a half years, the beast that ascendeth out of the top bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Jesus descends after having ascended. The beast ascends after having descended. What does that mean? There's a reference here to having lived and died and being judged worthy to the bottomless pit. But here we see a resurrection from the bottomless pit in the wild beast. That, 
that inference is, is that he had lived. And if that's the case, most likely, you know who that would be? Judas. Judas is a wild beast. Okay, I know. You know, you know what I do when I do this stuff? I really, if I had any credibility, I'd do away with it. I totally destroy it. Because the things that come out of my mouth are not things that come out of anybody else's mouth that I know of, with save exception of one. I do know one man, he's 82 years old right now. He's in Arizona, and he, he studied all the same men that I have studied over my life and has preached a similar message, and I <laughs> never have heard him say what I'm saying, but he, he's one that could have said this, that he that ascended out of the bottomless pit and killed the two witnesses was a su supernatural being who was the Antichrist. And has Satan, having been cast down to the earth, now resorts to that final, last ditch effort afforded to him somehow in the justice of God the ability to raise again from the pit this rebellious, greedy being Judas. This is known as the Antichrist. He that lived before. Listen, there's a whole lesson here just to talk about the Antichrist. And maybe I will, but not at the moment. But you should bring some bells. The Antichrist, he that lived and he was dead and now he lives again. Okay, there should be scriptures that, I'm not just spinning something out of my own imagination here. There's scriptural basis for these statements. Search them out. I'll help you. I mean, I'm, I'm in the process of learning these scriptures myself. I love to dig in them. I, love, I like the interaction. Uh, I, I get much of it on, on, uh, on email and text. The beast descends after he, having descended. It is this supernatural being that gets the victory over these two witnesses. We noticed that they were, not, they were not subject to death when all of the nations had attacked them. They killed their enemies with the words of their mouths. Fire. Plague. But all of a sudden, now they're defeated? Why? Because they're faced with a supernatural being, one who's been come up out of the bottomless pit that has powers that supersede their physical abilities. They're in a physical ability. They're in their flesh. They're physical. Thus, they die. Thus, it's proved. It's proved by those on this side that they were not of supernatural, were not God's prophets. And on this side, it proves God who is the God of resurrection. For in just a three and a half day period, he stands them up on their feet and then calls them into heaven. Why three and a half days? Well, hopefully I say it. I don't know if I say it here or not. I can't remember. Now in the resurrection, God of the old covenant ties together the purposes of the new covenant, the resurrection of the dead. Uh, God, the curse of death on man. Wow. Then God, in his wonderful, merciful, loving, salvation's way, takes nothing away from the justice of the death deserving of us who are sinners, but he he interjects and supersedes with another law, the law of the resurrection life. What a wondrous God who rescues us from ourselves. 
Now in their resurrection, the resurrection of the two uh, witnesses, God of the Old Covenant ties together the purposes of the New Covenant. Does he not tie the Old and the New together? Did he not take Elijah and Enoch, both of the Old Covenant, and tie them into the New Covenant by giving them resurrection life and calling them up into the heavenly place, this heavenly sphere where Christ now rules and reigns from along with his bride? Pretty marvelous. And, and also Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the, all the prophets. He joins them. Not, they, they're, they're not the only ones. They rise because as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. All in Christ shall be made alive. Their death testifies to the fact they were but men. And in their death, they testify they are the martyrs of God. They are killed in Jerusalem. They are not allowed to be buried. They would not make the mistake. These, the beast and those that, that killed them would not make the same mistake as those that, that appointed those to watch over the, the, the tomb of Jesus. They, said, they appointed guards. But it is said still unto today in Jewish circles that that the disciples came in the middle of the night and stole away the body and called him the resurrected. These will make not the same mistake. They will let these bodies corrupt in the sight of all that we'll see. I, there was no TV when this was written. How are all eyes of all those on the earth will see these corruptible, corrupting on the earth, the dogs and whatever, nudging nudging the bodies, sniffing and biting and gnawing. How, what form or shape they were in after three and a half days laying there. Why did Lazarus lay in the grave three and a half days? Because he corrupted. Because it was, it was, he was appointed to corruption. And apparently it must take three and a half days to be in corruption for the Lord raised in three and he was not corrupted. They are laying there three and a half days. Proves he, they are corrupted. I don't know. That just speaks loud to me. Just says something to me about the wonder of God that let these bodies lay there until they corrupt. And then stand them up on their feet. <laughs> oh, man. Won't that be a sight to behold? Hey, you'd throw your crown down too at the feet of the someone who could do that. All those who rejoiced in their death celebrate and rejoice as they watch their bodies lie in the street until they are corrupting. Not three days, as was the case of the Lord, and his body would see no crust, but like unto Lazarus, they now stink. Remember? The sister saying, Lord, he stink. They lay in the broad place likely over all three of the Sabbath days of religious of Jerusalem. I think that these two will die. They will be killed on a Thursday afternoon. And they'll lie there all day Friday on that Muslim Sabbath day. They'll lie there all day Saturday on that Jewish Sabbath. They'll lie there all day Sunday on that Christian Sabbath. And witness to all three of those religions that will and are predominant there in Jerusalem. And after three and a half days they were resurrected and stood up upon their feet. Great fear falls upon the spectators, but is not the kind of reverential fear of God, but a temporary fear of God like unto that which fell upon Pharaoh and Egypt. It soon passes. There's other examples you can use of that, that, that type of, of uh, fear that doesn't lead to uh, a change of heart. And they heard a great voice out of the heavens, saying to them, Ascend hither, and they ascended into the heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. They were not just merely raised from among the dead, but they were then raised up into the heavenly place to join with all those new covenant faithful who preceded them. They were taken from the outer court of the earth to the inner court of the heavenly place. Under the gospel age of the last 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit was 
sent down to empower messengers with testimony of mercy. Listen, that is why we're to turn the other cheek and walk the extra mile, give the cloak with the cloak, pray for our enemies, take no thought for a suffered wrong, All of these are the witness and the testimony of Christ's disciples in the earth, uh, witnesses uh, to the time of mercy and grace. There's a time when they who are extending mercy and grace to their own hurt will rise up and rule and reign with a rod of iron. It's in the next age. But in this age, we are called to that of mercy and grace. That's why we, we refuse to kill. That, that's, that's why we're harmless as doves. That's why we seek no revenge. That's why we lay down our lives one for another. That's why we love the world. The world as it relates to to men's souls, not to the world as it relates to material. These are all of the, the laws of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This is all that perfecting that through the resurrected life, the character and nature of Christ within us. These are all the laws of Christ that represent a worthiness fit to rule and reign one who's able to give up their life, lay down their life, and kill, destroy their flesh. The two dynamics, laying down of your life and the taking up of the cross. Living an unselfish life, loving, while taking dominion over the flesh. The nations, as is the church at this moment, are in general quite indifferent about the gospel, but soon indifference will turn to sorrow in the one and militant in the other. I'm talking about Christians and I'm talking about the world, just Gentiles in general. In the one that it resonates, as Luke was referring to, it will create a, a sense of loss and sorrow. For You'll find yourself in, where, still on the earth instead of being caught up. You being faced with the circumstances that yet before you to qualify, but it is a hard row to hoe. In those, it will be sorrowful for the loss of the first, of the first resurrection. In, as it relates to the, to the first fruits, not as it relates to the harvest, there's still a chance for that. But in the others, it'll become militant. They'll hate God, curse God, and speak out against God. They are angry. They feared God, but not anymore. The kingdom of God now becomes military. As I said, it's become punitive and destructive. He's not expecting any repentance. The reward and the kingdom are nearly the same in the scriptural expression. The reward and the kingdom are nearly the same in New Covenant expression. So it is seen in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit and the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heavens. Hey, it's not the kingdom of heaven, the third heaven where God is. It's the kingdom of heavens in the heavenly calling, Hebrews chapter 3, 1 in the heavens above the earth. That's the inheritance right here. We don't ever go here. Never go to heaven. Heaven comes to us, doesn't it? In the New Jerusalem. Heaven comes to the earth. Rightly divide the Word of God. Eternal life is the gift of God to each believer. No question. Word of God says it. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. 
The kingdom is a reward to those accounted worthy. Luke chapter 20, 35. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5. Hence, Paul's fear, lest he be rejected at the last. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. Rejected from what? From the idea of, of receiving eternal life? No, he knew he had eternal life. He, what he was unsure of is whether or not he was to be found worthy to rule and reign with Christ in the heavenly realm. That was his concern. He said he would give up all, everything. Everything was dung compared to the being found worthy at the resurrection, the first resurrection out from among the dead. The millennial kingdom is thrown open to all, but there is different ranks and different orders of resurrection as seen in 1 Corinthians 15 and reward as seen in Matthew 10, 41 and 42. That's where I put a period because it was 1235 and I had to come here, be here by one. And I hadn't, hadn't printed and hadn't showered, hadn't shaved. So I, I stopped there. I had, I, you know, I was going. I was cooking. In my mind, anyway. It may not be in your minds. But I, there's no particular reason to stop right there as if that was the end of this message. This message goes on and on and on and on and on. And, you, you know, you, 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 you can make it go on and on and on by searching out these things, whether they be so, like some good Bereans. Hey, it matters not to me, personally, uh, if you agree or disagree. What matters is whether or not it's the Word of God. That's for you to sort out and find out. There are things in there that hopefully are not meant to cause division or secretarianism, you know, and divide, but hopefully there's things in there that will cause you wonder and awe and to set your compass toward the kingdom of God. I want to inherit the kingdom of God. Everything else is superfluous, or not, the word's not superfluous. The other, the, everything else is unimportant compared to the kingdom inheritance. That's what I hope that it does. Jerry, would you dismiss us? Sure.